Et maintenant, nous partons encore plus à l'est et encore plus au nord sur le site d'Arslan TP. Arslan TP qui nous est présenté par Federico Manuelli, euh, dont le doctorat euh, justement s'est intéressé euh, à ce site d'Arslan TP, et notamment les Eastern Anatolian Society in Late Bronze Age, Hittite Influence and Local Tradition in Arslan TP. Alors, il fouille évidemment avec euh, Marcella Frangipane à Arslan TP. Et euh, ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est qu'effectivement, le, le site, après les, les fouilles de, de, de la porte, donc, a été pendant des décennies euh, une, grande fouille, euh, euh, une grande fouille italienne, alors qui s'est plutôt euh, pendant longtemps intéressée au niveau euh, calcolitique. Et euh, justement, depuis le début des années 2000, eh euh, l'équipe de Marcella Fangipane et de euh, Federico Manuelli travaille également de nouveau sur les, les niveaux du, euh, de, de l'âge du fer. Alors, euh, je me... Parmi les, les articles qu'a écrit Federico, il y a bien entendu « The King at the Gate, Monumental Fortifications and the Rise of Local Elite and, um, Arslan, at Arslan Tepe at the end of the second millennium BC ». C'est vraiment, euh, ça fait partie donc, de, ces, euh, euh, de ces articles extrêmement intéressants sur la réévaluation euh, des datations euh, des monuments euh, de la ville. Euh, qui m'ont notamment euh, beaucoup aidé pour la préparation donc, de, euh, de l'exposition et de son catalogue. Et je lui laisse maintenant la parole pour qu'il nous présente en détail euh, ses nouveaux travaux. Merci. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, I want to express my honor and pleasure to be presenting my research here in such a prestigious institution. And I want to take the opportunity to thank Vincent Blanchard for his kind invitation and the organization of this wonderful event. So, uh, I present now the results obtained during the last investigations and researches conducted at Arslan Tepe. The presentation will focus on an attempt to reorganize the large set of Iron Age sculptured reliefs brought to light at the site in the past, on the basis of the new discoveries that have been carried out. This implies not only a chronological review of the material, but also a critical re-examination of the use of specific ideological and celebrative messages expressed by the employment of these cultures. While it is true that the considerable number of artworks from Arslan Tepe has been discovered in the past outside of its context of use, the motivation behind this research lies in the fact that, for the first time, during the last campaigns, new bus reliefs have been finally found in their primary context, allowing new hypotheses and insights for a rearrangement of the old set of sculptures. So, in a general historical framework, the collapse of the Hittite Empire at the beginning of the 12th century BC led to a reorganization of its former peripheries, with the emergence of local elites that re-elaborated the late Bronze Age imperial traditions in original ways, using elements of cultural continuity with the earlier period, but in a different and more fragmented political scenario. In this picture, Arslan Tepe represents an emblematic case. The site is located in the fertile Malatya Plain, at a few kilometers south of the Euphrates River, between the Taurus and the Anti-Taurus chain, and 912 meters above the sea level. Because of its environment, standing between the fluvial plain and the rich mountains zones, the control of the Malatyas areas has always been considered crucial for the neighboring civilizations, stimulating over the centuries its interaction with the Anatolian, the Syro-Mesopotamian, and the Transcaucasian War. These facts stand out during the 14th and the 13th century BC, when the region started orbiting the Hittite center and being progressively affected by the influence of the central Anatolian power. Nonetheless, the borders of the region remain always evanescent, fluctuating according to the balance of forces between the adjacent states. This is evident in the fact that Malitia, that is the ancient name of Arslan Tepe, is attested in only seven cuneiform texts from Boasquei, always in connection to local revolts and regional invasions referring to the worries of the Hittite kings in controlling this borderland. 
On the other hand, during the Iron Age, relief sculptures and rock inscriptions discovered at the site and its surrounding territory indicate the existence of a new important and independent regional polity, named Malizzi, which its capital at Arslantepe and its domain extending to the west of the Malatya Plain. The analysis of the Luvian hieroglyphic inscriptions carved on the earliest monuments highlights the strong dynastic lineage that the early Iron Age kings of Malizzi had with the late Bronze Age Hittite royalty. Rock inscriptions proclaim the genealogical lines linking Kuziteshup, who was the last known king of the Hittite dynasty that ruled at the viceregal seat of Carchemish at the beginning of the 12th century BC, with the country lords of Malizzi. They testify that while the central power at Hattusha had vanished, the surviving line of rulers at Carchemish was tied with a dynasty of Arslantepe kings, stressing the endurance in the Euphrates region of the tight royal authority during the post-imperial era. These evidences are important for a better understanding of the development of the kingdom of Malizzi during the last centuries of the second millennium BC and for the comprehension of the actual weight that the political and ideological continuity of the late Bronze Age traditions played into the formation of the new political entity. Moreover, it is also essential for a wider reconstruction of the Iron Age Anatolian societies, since they depict a different scenario for the supposed 12th century BC Dark Age, illustrating a situation characterized by rather slow processes of transformation than abrupt breaks. More than a few problems arise in any case when trying to go through the details of these processes and especially to match the situation that emerged from the historical sources with the evidence of the archaeological record. The biggest issue concerned the nature of the data coming from Arslantepe itself. Indeed, the rich collection of figurative monuments has been discovered during the first explorations of the site at the beginning of the previous century and can hardly be employed in an actual reconstruction of the site development, given the doubts concerning their original context and the lack of associated stratigraphy. This actually represents one of the main problematic with dating the individual stylistic groups of the Syro-Anatolian art during the post hittite period. Investigations at the main sites have been conducted during the first half of the 20th century, and the chronologies were mostly built with antiquarian approaches based on the stylistic and iconographic examination of sculptures brought to light from uncertain contexts. Moreover, differences in style found at contemporary places, as well as the existence of long-lived traits, the deliberate use of archaism, and the widely attested practice of reuse of the slabs can also mislead the dating of the monuments in the absence of reliable contexts. The case of Arslantepe is representative with this problematic. Many attempts of classification, mostly aimed to achieve a specific chronological assessment and evolution of the monuments over time, as well as to try to solve the problem concerning the original location of some of the sculptures, have been raised and not always answered successfully. A brief introduction to the history of these discoveries and studies up to the most recent investigation at the site is necessary. The entire repertoire of the figurative stone monuments coming from Arslantepe consists to date of a total amount of 26 spacements that can be divided in four functional categories, bas reliefs, portal lions, stele, and statues. Considering that most of the discoveries are bas reliefs, the analysis has always mostly focused on their examination. The first regular round of investigations at the Mound of Arslantepe was conducted by Louis de Laporte in the 1930s. His excavations broke to light the famous so-called Lion's Gate that provided a first idea about the monumentality of the Neotite settlement, especially because of the abundance of the figurative bas reliefs that the author included in his final publication. The Lion's Gate has been discovered and destroyed by a huge fire, and this event was associated with the punishment inflicted by, Sargon II, by Sargon II of Assyria in 712 BC 
to the local ruler Tarkunazi for having broken his loyalty oath. These circumstances are described in both the annal of the king and fragments of cylinder inscriptions found at the site itself. On the contrary of what is generally thought, most of the artworks published by the Laporte had already been discovered before the French expedition took place. In fact, he only brought to light six in situ sculptures, but he also integrated into his reconstruction other nine blocks previously discovered on the surface of the mound and the near village by some of the explorers who had visited the site in the past. Moreover, the Laporte did not take into consideration the whole repertoire of sculptured monuments known at this time, but only those that, in his opinion, belonged to Lion's Gate. These facts, of course, lead to confusion into the following analysis and study of these findings. In the absence of a proper stratigraphy and appropriate knowledge regarding the associated material, the Lion's Gate has been usually analyzed exclusively on the basis of the style and iconography of the bas reliefs, and generally dated to a broad late second first quarter of the first millennium BC. The iconographic and stylistic classification of the whole ensemble of monuments into the so-called Three Malatya styles, codified by Winfred Ortmann in 1971, is still nowadays accepted by the scientific community. Just briefly, Style one is characterized by the presence of ritual and religious themes, while style two represents unscenes and style three single images or antithetical figures involving apotropaic creatures. Stylistically, figures from style one and three can be considered close since they share the manner in which anatomic details are expressed, while those from style two present rather different artistic traits. Moreover, Style 1 is associated with short inscriptions, and Style 2 with longer one, while these are totally missing in Style 3. The main trait emerging by analyzing the Arslantepe's cultural repertoire is the affinity that it has to the tight imperial art, especially observable in all the bas reliefs belonging to the first style. The memory of Tate tight is specifically evident through the use of scenes celebrating religious themes. The libation in front of the deities is the main subject represented, following an iconography attested during the tight period and spread by several media. The storm god is the most frequently represented deity. On one of the most renewed relief, the god is depicted twice, driving his eagle chariot drawn by bulls and facing the local king follows a model well known from rock monuments, seal impressions and cultic objects belonging to the Hittite heritage. Despite the fact that the three styles, classification and related evolution of their Slantepe sculptures is still considered highly reliable, a big problem has been always its association with an absolute chronology. This has been mostly smoothed out thanks to the comprehensive re-examination of the Luvian hieroglyphic inscriptions carved on some of the artworks carried out by David Hawkins. The development of the analysis has, recent, has recently led to a chronological reassessment of the genealogical line of the Malizis king and, as a consequence, of most of the sculptures to a period stretching between the early 12th century and the end of the 11th century BC. Nonetheless, this evidence is of course opened to new questions, specifically related to how the construction of the Lion's Gate that always represent the context of discovery of some of the reliefs. These facts have gradually brought scholars to the common accepted idea that the Lion's Gate is known other than a construction wherein spolia blocks coming from earlier Iron Age contexts have been reused. A confirmation of this interpretation was in fact already provided by the discoveries carried out by a second French team, directed by Claude Schaffer, that shortly resumed the investigations at Ars Nantepe in 1948. Indeed, in a trench open and underneath the Lion's Gate, he brought to light the remains of an ancient gate system, from where 
it was assumed that some of the sculptures found into the Lion's Gate might have been originally located. The first round of investigations by the Italian archaeological expedition during the 1960s unfortunately did not provide further insights into this issue. The excavation in the northern part of the mound, in the area previously examined by the French teams, allowed the discovery of the continuous late bronze and iron age sequence, but only scattered traces of an ancient gate system. Yet, the most important discovery in those years was an even earlier chamber at Gateway, dated to the 13th century BC and destroyed by the conflagration which brought an end to the late Bronze Age settlement. In 1971, a long phase of interruption of the investigations on the second millennium BC started when excavations at the site shifted focus to the southern slope of the mound where imposing and marvelous monumental architecture, mainly dating to the late Calcolithic period, were brought to light. On one side, these discoveries allowed Arslan Tepe to be included in the UNESCO World Heritage Sites tentative list and formed the core of the on-site open-air museum inaugurated in 2011, but on the other, provoked a gradual decrease of interest in the excavation and study of the historical levels. A new targeted project of excavation and study start, began in 2008 with the aim of finally uncovering fresh material and data, excavated and analyzed with modern methodologies, to provide valid answers concerning the site's development during the second and first millennia BC. A large sector adjacent to the Lion's Gate area has been investigated and a long and continuous sequence stretching from the 12th century BC to the Assyrian occupation at the site has been brought to light. The most important discovery of the, last, of the later phases is a succession of three monumental pillared buildings connected with different phases of use of the Lion's Gate. Material sealed between the floor levels provided, for the first time, a secure date for the construction of the gate system, which can now be confidently set at the beginning of the 8th century BC, further supporting the fact that the bas reliefs were reused from earlier structures. Below the earlier monumental hall, a succession of two phases dated to the 10th and 9th century BC and characterized by the presence of large silos and pits have been identified. This represents an interesting discontinuity in the management of this part of the site, since the area appears during this period to have been specifically devoted to storing activities. This break is especially evident when looking at the structures underneath, since these are characterized by the overlapping of two monumental early Iron Age levels, respectively dated to the 12th and 11th century BC. This provides important evidence concerning the weight that the late Bronze Age tradition played into the formation of the new societies following the fragmentation of the Hittite Empire. The most remarkable finding of the early Iron Age level is a massive fortification wall of mud bricks on stone foundations. The total preserved height of the wall, including the foundation, is almost 4 meters, and its exposed length is approximately 30 meters. The destruction of the fortification wall was catastrophic, as attested by a thick layer of heavily barred debris. Radiometric analysis confidently dated this destruction to the end of the 11th, <coughs> beginning of the 10th century BC, and establishing a terminus antequem for the early Iron Age sequence. The layer of debris sealed a thin mud plastered floor on which two new figurative bas reliefs and five aniconic slabs have been found. The two new reliefs belong to the above-mentioned third Malatya styles. The figures are carved on large squared blocks and are realized with soft traits and plastic profiles rich in details. One depicts a winged demon with a pine cone and a flower in his hands. It wears a hide head dress, short skirt, and shoes with upturned toes. The large one displays an antithetical scene with two eagle bird head hybrid demons with lion path foot at the two sides of a long leaves tall stem palmette with volutes. They both carry, on one end, a tree pronged lightning. 
The context of discovery of the reliefs may be better understood integrating the results of the first round of excavations carried out in this sector by the Italian expedition. An extension of the fortification wall eastwards can be now recognized. In this picture, it can be assumed that the gate system was originally present at the junction of the two areas, and this is specifically supported by the fact that this was the exact spot where Schaffer excavated his trench, and where he stated to have found a gateway preceding the Lion's Gate. Underneath the plastered floor, where the reliefs have been found, an earlier level with fairly monumental structures have been excavated. It consists of two rooms characterized by several phases of construction and use. Interestingly, no trace of destruction by fire has been recognized in this case. Moreover, several clues indicate the existence of a coeval enclosure subsequently embedded in the construction of the later fortification wall. The finding of the two new bars reliefs and their integration in the stratigraphic and architectural sequence of the site, as well as their association with well-contextualized material, offer new sources of information for inspecting the use of this form of art at the site. They first of all represent the only sculptures within the old repertoire from Ars Lantepe that have been found in association with their primary context of use, providing us with a clear snapshot of one specific phase of life of the Iron Age citadel. Considering their position on the floor connected with the fortification wall and their good state of preservation, as well as their association with the aniconic slabs, it seems realistic to state that they were at their very last stage of manufacturing and were also about to be installed, where the fire that destroyed the settlement sealed them with its debris. Moreover, it seems also reasonable to assume that their exact destination was the gate system found by Schaffer, unearthed the Lyos Gate. A more precise reconstruction of this phase of life of the Iron Age citadel of Arslantepe can be reached by integrating into this picture the other sculptures brought to light at the site in the past. As said, the new bas reliefs belong to the so-called third Malatya style, as especially the comparison with those found by von der Osten in the vicinity of the mound show. This allows the reconstruction of a complete and coherent sculptural group, wherein the two blocks with the antithetic hybrid demons stood at the center of the performed scenes, while the four-winged genius were placed at each of their side. A more detailed iconographic and stylistic analysis of the reliefs also allow a better chronological assessment. Interestingly, the themes here reproduced find their roots in the northern Mesopotamian traditions of the 14th and 13th century BC. Specifically, the long-lived tall stample mat with rolled in volute, associated with antithetic hybrid demons, as well as the winged genius with pine cone developed from the Syro Mesopotamian and Middle Assyrian glyptic trends. In any case, it is also clear that these motifs are here represented within a different mix of tendencies and traditions. The affinities that these sculptures have to the tight art are indeed well observable when comparing with the earlier monuments from Arslantepe. This is specifically visible on individual motifs and attributes such as clothing, accoutrement, and anatomic details of the sculpted figures that drive us back to the tight imperial period. The stylistic details merge with the above-mentioned Syro-Mesopotamian repertoire, creating a sort of discontinuity with the past that projects these sculptures toward the new trends typical of the 10th century BC Syro-Anatolian art. Indeed, the hybrid apotropaic figures and antithetical scenes resemble those of the Herald Wall and the early cycles of the Kingsgate at Carchemish, as well as those from the final phase of the Storm God Temple at Aleppo. All this data led to the conclusion that a final phase of renovation and refurnishing of the citadel of Arslantepe with a new set of figurative bas reliefs was in progress when the conflagration that destroyed the settlements towards the beginning of the 10th century BC took place. On a wider perspective, considering the fact that the excavated fortification wall had a rather long lifespan that can certainly start at the late 12th century BC, 
it seems plausible to assume that at least part of the figurative reliefs found reuse in the Lion's Gate or emerging from the surface of the mound were originally located in this context. The use of the different sculptural cycles might thus correspond to different phases of renovation of the citadel of Arslantepe. Although the actual positioning of the single stone blocks is impossible to reconstruct, their stylistic evolution clearly attests to an uninterrupted refurbishment of the figurative and celebratory apparatus of the gateway and its adjacent structures. These facts are actually perfect coherent with what is known about the practices of constant renewal of the decorative equipment of the main Cyronatolian sites from the final late bronze to the Iron Age. The clearest example of these procedures has been performed at the well-known citadel of Aleppo with the renovation of the 11th century BC storm god temple with sculptures blocks that date back to the Hittite imperial period. A similar practice was most probably also attested at the sanctuary of Aindara, where sculptures iconographically comparable to those from Hattusha and Aleppo have been reused next to others that hardly can be dated before the beginning of the 11th century BC. At Tel Alaf, some of the so-called small orthostal discovered in the 9th century BC Temple Palace of Kapara present, next to the inscriptions belonging to this period, earlier epithets that might testify their reuse and the later addiction of engraved signs. At Carchemish, the development of the water gate from an earlier 2nd millennium BC prototype, including the renovation of its decorative apparatus, has been repeatedly suggested. Moreover, in the gateway structures of the 8th century BC fortress of Azatiwata at Karatepe, some slabs controversially show traces of refitting and possible integration of later inscriptions next to the existing images. It has been also recently suggested that the bas reliefs of the south gate at Zinchirli might have originally been located at the nearby Panchar Leoyuk and later reused when the site was refounded at the end of the 10th century BC. To conclude, the iconographic de development of the Malatya cultural cycles indeed falls within a generalized trend of continuous rebuilding of some of the most representative structures of the main Iron Age Syro Anatolian site. The reuse of old sculptures placed side by side with new one, besides the most practical reasons related to the evident difficulties in working and transporting new blocks, might have been linked to the effort exerted by the new local rulers to perpetuate and preserve over time the symbolic value and visual memory associated with these monuments. At Arslantepe, it is clear how the use of a figurative repertoire strictly linked with the tight iconography and its ideological memory was specifically adopted during the earliest Iron Age phases with the aim to concretely legitimize the new authority, stressing its lineage with the prestigious past. The gradual achievement in the consolidation of power of the new rulers most probably allowed the progressive introduction of innovative themes, projecting these societies to a wider new tastes. Despite the inevitable necessity to join more data and further evidence to this puzzling picture, Stratigraphic and architectural evidence, as well as the evolution of the main iconographic and stylistic traits of the bas reliefs, show the presence of three main phases of reorganization of the figurative monuments. The results of the current excavations demonstrate that a last phase of renovation took place between the end of the 11th and the very beginning of the 10th century BC and has been probably never accomplished due to the final and complete destruction of the citadel. With the awareness that a definitive solution and understanding of the details of the evolution of their Zantepe reliefs is nearly impossible to obtain, it is nonetheless clear that every single piece provides important insights for a better comprehension of this puzzle. In this framework, the Kingdom of Malizzi seems to emerge strictly emulating the royal models of the central Hittite court and establishing a local power that was certainly related to the development of Carchemish. 
In any case, the continuous friezes showing the performance of rituals and ceremonies adorning the citadel of Arslantepe during the period following the demise of the Tite Empire are still the most evident manifestation of the celebrative apparatus employed by the Iron Age local elites at the dawn of the new era. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>